Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Pia Brinkman will defend her defend the academic thesis, altered listening changes the way we predict the auditory environment. The candidate, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the, and the conclusions of your thesis? Highly esteemed prorector, members of the opposition, supervisors, colleagues, family and friends, thank you all for joining me today, either in person or online, for the defense of my dissertation entitled Altered Listening Changes the Way We Predict the Auditory Environment. Let's have a closer look at this and unpack this title from the back. What do I mean when I speak of predicting the auditory environment? Imagine you take part in a swimming competition. You are ready, waiting to hear, take your marks before you jump into the water. If you would hear, take your bananas, you would be surprised or maybe confused. This word is not what you predicted. This is an example of a deviation of a what prediction. Similarly, if you would here take your marks, you would be surprised, as the time interval between the words your and marks would, not be, would unexpectedly be long. Here we speak of a manipulation of a when prediction. When predictions, when predictions can also take different forms. They may relate to the length of a time interval, but also to the order of the words in a sequence, for example. In the work performed during my PhD, I focused on listening and how the brain processes different types of predictions when we are exposed to sound. When we hear something, sound waves travel along the auditory pathway and pass from the outer ears through the inner ears and via the brainstem to the brain. Here, the signal reaches a small structure, which is depicted in blue here. And this is also called the medial geniculate nucleus or the auditory thalamus. Then the signal is processed in higher cortical areas. And what do I mean by altered listening? Altered listening refers to changes occurring in the listening process. Here, I tested older adults and persons with tinnitus and compared their brain activity to the activity of control groups. Older adults de describe adults above the age of 65, and they make up to approximately 20% of the Dutch population. We all know that our hearing changes when we age, which can, amongst other reasons, be explained by specific age-related damage, such as age-related decline in hair cells, for example. Tinnitus, on the other hand, can sound like this. It describes a condition where affected persons hear a sound without a physical sound source. This is often a high-pitched beep tone, but it can also be a low-frequency hum, a buzzing, or a hissing sensation. It can be experienced in one or both ears, and it can be chronic, or it can occur intermittently. Tinnitus affects approximately 10 to 14% of the general population. It is a heterogeneous condition, which means that persons experiencing it it differ on at least of one in one of the following dimensions, which is either the perception of the tinnitus, the tinnitus distress, the treatment responses, and the causal risk factors or the comorbidities. We also know that tinnitus can occur in the absence of hearing loss or damage to the auditory system, and that it is likely a cortical phenomenon. Thus, the development of, of tinnitus can be linked to more unspecific or no damage. Having all this background information, we can go over to the aims of this dissertation. The first aim was to investigate prediction networks in the tinnitus brain while focusing on the auditory thalamus. The second aim was to assess what and when predictions in older adults, which I did in chapter three, and also in persons with tinnitus, which I did in chapter four. To assess the first aim, a literature review was performed we looked at how predictions might occur in the tinnitus brain. First, we found that the functioning of the auditory part of the thalamus is frequently changed in persons with tinnitus, but often underrepresented in research. Moreover, we looked at how brain areas communicate with each other. We found that the communication between the auditory thalamus and brain areas primarily involved in listening seems to be reduced while increased levels of communication were found between the auditory cortex, auditory thalamus, and higher areas um, involved in higher cognitive function. 
We hypothesize that different activity levels of the neurons in the auditory thalamus play a role in predicting sounds that are altered in persons with tinnitus. During my PhD, I performed two experiments to measure listening. And how did we do this? We invited participants to the laboratory and had them listen to sounds while we recorded their electroencephalographic brain activity. On the x-axis, you see the time in milliseconds, and on the y-axis, you see the activity represented in amplitude, which is here depicted in microvolts. The, the brain activity we are looking at consists of average brain signals of multiple participants across many trials. Here, the focus will be on the early P50 component and on the later N100 component. The positive P50 arises approximately 50 milliseconds after an auditory event and reflects sensory processing or hearing in general, while the negative N100 arises approximately 100 milliseconds after an auditory event and is also related to selective attention. So if people are actually listening. From previous research, we know that smaller amplitudes from the P50 and N100 translate to more efficient processing. In my PhD, I used two slightly different EEG paradigms to measure different levels of predictability, which are presented in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4 here. For Chapter 3, the paradigm I implemented is called an oddball paradigm. In this paradigm, the participant listens to a sequence of stimuli. Within the sequence, there's one frequently occurring stimulus, which is called the standard, and one less frequently occurring stimulus, which is called the deviant. This stimulus differs from the standard in a feature that the experimenter is interested in. In my case, we used we use tone that differed in pitch. Here is an example of the depicted sequence. This was our way to detect what det to detect what predictions or deviations in what predictions. In a second sequence, the same tones were played. For improved representation, I use different colors here, but the two tones are used the same. Now the time interval between the tones changed, rendering the occurrence of each tone unpredictable, the unpredictable sequence. Again, here's another example. And this enabled us to assess when predictions. Ultimately, we wanted to see whether there are group differences between the older and the younger adult group. I'm going to give a brief overview of the findings for this paradigm. First, we look at the results for the P50 component for the older and the younger adult group. You can see that the older and younger adults process standard tones in the predictable sequence differently. In other words, we can see smaller amplitudes, there's more efficient processing in the group of younger adults when compared um, to the group of older adults. When we look at the activity for the deviant tone in the predictable sequence, we see that younger adults respond with a higher amplitude, while there's no difference between the responses to the towards the different tones in the, younger, in the older group. A similar pattern can be observed for the standard tone in the unpredictable sequence. Lastly, we look at the deviant tone in the unpredictable sequence and see that younger adults have a higher amplitude response than older adults do. To summarize, for younger adults, we saw that the amplitudes were smallest for the most predictable tones and built up as the level of predictability decreased. This is what we expected to see, more efficient processing of highly predictable events and less efficient processing of more unpredictable events. This can translate to differences in what and when predictions for the younger, but not for the older adult group here we can conclude that younger and older adults likely differ in their sensory processing. In the following N100 component, we see that the standard tones are processed differently from the deviant tones in the predictable condition. And that this difference holds for both auditory sequences. Moreover, we see no group differences here. We can conclude that the processing of what predictions is similar across the tested groups and the two conditions. This may suggest that selective attention or active listening did not differ between the two groups. 
In the next chapter, I implemented a similar paradigm with only small changes. We played the same standard and deviant tones to assess what predictions. And we added a sequence where we manipulated the time intervals. However, in chapter four, we tested a group with chronic tinnitus and compared their brain activity to persons without tinnitus. The participants were matched for age and on average 47 years old. <coughs> now again, we are looking at the results. Again, we can see lower amplitudes for more predictable tones that translate to differences in what and when predictions. Moreover, we can see that the deflections are similar in both groups and also similar to the ones that we saw previously uh, for the young adult group in chapter three. Therefore, we can assume that early processing of different levels of predictability is similar in persons uh, with tinnitus and controls. When we look at the N100 component, we can see that for the control group, which is depicted here at the bottom, deviant tones are differently processed between the timing conditions. This is not the case for the tinnitus group. We can conclude from this that selective attention towards a deviating sound might be differently processed in persons with chronic tinnitus. Uh, to conclude, throughout my PhD, I have shown that the functioning of the auditory thalamus plays an important role in the tinnitus brain and that it is underrepresented in tinnitus research. This opens up new alleys for future research, such as including the auditory thalamus as a target for new exciting treatment approaches, such as deep brain stimulation, for example. Moreover, we saw that pro the processing of what and when predictions change when we age. And that in tinnitus, early responses to what and when predictions seems to be comparable, and here we speak about the P50 component. To summarize, I performed a literature review where I also developed a theoretical framework about alterations in predictive processing in persons with tinnitus and investigated different levels of auditory predictive processing in older adults and persons with tinnitus using EG data. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and herewith, I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much for your clear presentation and the work you did on the supervision of the promotion team, Professor Kotz, uh, Dr. Janse, and Dr. Schwarze. And I would like to open your position by giving the word to Professor uh, Fomisano, who is a, a professor of neural signaling analysis, signal analysis, working at Maastricht University. Thank you. Uh, dear uh, candidate, first of all, congratulations for this work. Uh, I, I read it with uh, great pleasure and I learned a lot. I, I thought like the, 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 the uh, theoretical uh, uh, setting, the review of the literature, which is not easy because it's quite mixed up and quite, uh, mm -hmm. quite complex, uh, it was, uh, was very, uh, uh, very clear and very, um, uh, very interesting. I also think that the, the experiments have been designed uh, very well. So congratulations, uh, for sure. And also the presentation was uh, super clear. Um, my, my question uh, the, goes a little bit in uh, trying to understand the differences of result between the two empirical chapter, mm -hmm. uh, right? I mean, so I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think the, the study on aging, uh, it's basically great from the perspective that, you know, as an experimenter, you get exactly the results that you were uh, expecting from the hypothesis. Well, at least like the, some of the markers were clearly different between the two groups. This is not the case for the tinnitus, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you, you, you formulate the hypothesis in terms of a different mechanism of prediction that could be different. Mm -hmm. However, when I read the, the chapters, as I was looking at these uh, multi-factor ANOVAs and uh, interactions, <laughs> Yeah, right, I mean, so the, the, the things are not super different, right? I mean, so now I would like to have your opinion on this. Um, do you think it's some aspect of the design that could mm -hmm. have be different? Or, you know, like the tinnitus has not much to do with prediction? What would be your, after having conducted this study, what would be your conclusion, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your question. Um, yes, you're right, I understand what you mean. Um, I think 
yeah, there are multiple options. First of all, um, the population is different, right? We're working with pe people that have tinnitus and the age range that we, <coughs> that the people, the age range that the people had that we tested uh, was very broad. Um, so I think this is um, one factor that, yeah, plays, comes into role here. Um, on the other hand, also the design was different. So the time intervals um, between the pairs was quite short for the chapter four. So maybe um, also some differences that we thought, saw in chapter, I don't know, in the other chapter with the aging about the P300, for example, was not so prominent because we had no chance to look at this because the, the time interval was shorter. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe, maybe yeah. just uh, one thing that I was thinking uh, yeah. uh, during the design was the, the the frequency of the tones, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not really matched to the tinnitus, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you, uh, I mean, if you speak about predictions, mm -hmm. that should be spectrally specific, at least the what mm, for yeah. tinnitus, or you know, like I, 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 you know, like depends on the theories, I guess. But uh, you know, like in principle, you could suspect it that if you uh, uh, would be an idea to, uh, uh, you know, like fine tune the, the the tone stimulation such that matches at least gets closer to the tinnitus. Yeah, I agree. So there, there's literature um, that says that in tinnitus there's like a general prediction um, alterations or problems. Mm -hmm. So then this should not be specific to the frequency of the tones. Also, when we link this back to the theoretical framework, we think that the different firing modes of the thalamus might be altered, and that's why we process sounds differently. So this is not then dependent on the frequency of the tones, but I see your point. And um, I think um, maybe people um, would have a reacted differently if we would have matched the tones to the individual tinnitus frequency. I think it would have been a bit complicated to match for every participant, again, every single frequency and then adapt the paradigm and play those tones. But I think this is definitely something that we should look into in the future. Well, empirically, you do see that the, you know, the tinnitus is masked when you use mm -hmm. like, a, a, well, not forever, otherwise we, that, that would be solved, yeah. you know, but there is some masking at least, right? And yeah. So in principle, it could be an idea. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are uh, there other reasons you, you can, well, I, I mean, for, for me, the, the most surprising thing from a theoretical point of view was like the linking this to the temporal uh, yeah. predictions. And there you find some evidence, but yeah. What, what would you say? What would be your... Yeah, I actually, I have another thought about the frequency of the tones. I, sorry, I'm a bit slow. Um, we also used the tones, uh, first of all, because they were already implemented in previous paradigms, and then we wanted to, yeah, to be able to compare this literature. And also, we did not use high-frequency tones because a lot of people had hearing loss in high frequency, so we wanted to make sure that people experienced the tone on a different level, uh, on the same level, um, and not impaired in those frequency. So this was the third to the last question, sorry. Um, and then your question was about uh, the timing predictions, right? Yeah, um, yeah. so um, yeah, we think um, that um, the um, firing modes in the um, auditory thalamus is altered in people that experience tinnitus, and this might be sensitive, sensitive to temporal predictions, so that uh, we have this burst mode and this tonic firing mode, and then um, they may um, forward tr in information to higher cognitive areas, for example, in different ways. This was one of the predictions that we had. Um, yeah. So maybe then this is not as strongly um, affected in people that suffer from tinnitus. This is also a finding, right? So um, maybe. Or in the future, it would also be cool if, um, for example, we would use different manipulation of those temporal predictions and not have only two sequences, like one isochronous and one random, but also different temporal intervals or have them judge time intervals on a different level um, and assess different level of temporal predictability and not only with two sequences. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, that would also be an option. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Bendixson, <clears throat> Professor in Structure and Function of Cognitive Systems at the University of Technology in Chemnitz. She's not there. Thank you. Dear candidate, first of all, let me congratulate you on your excellent thesis and on your very clear presentation of it today. 
Um, so it is very impressive how you reveal uh, results in terms of both aging and in terms of tinnitus. My first question is a little bit more overarching in terms of the concepts of prediction that you're using. So in your thesis, you make a very strong case that um, there are what predictions and when predictions, and then that the third type of prediction that ought to be investigated is position predictions. I would like to, you to comment a bit on this concept, um, both in terms of terminology, but also on its on the overarching meaning of what a position prediction or what what is how is this different from the distinction between what and when that is more established in the literature, and what would that imply for also other studies on predictability. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your compliments and your question. Um, yeah, I completely see the point. So um, in the work of my PhD, we defined um, first prediction, then sensory gating, and then the levels below this are the what predictions and the when predictions, and the when predictions can be further yeah, split into this position prediction. Um, yeah, the reason we, for me, it was... There were multiple reasons to do this. There were some practical reasons because we also wanted to assess classical sensory gating and in the literature classical sensory gating is done with two standard tones. So then you have to differentiate between the first tone standard tone in the first position and the second tone. And normally in the literature, they only say S1 and S2. But then, I don't know, I think this is a bit messy. And we already had this formal and temporal prediction differentiation. And then we needed another term that I don't know, describes this effect as well somehow. Um, so this was one reason. Um, also, the position prediction, maybe it would have been also adequate to use a where, but then only where in the pair or where in the sequence, because, yeah, it needs to describe the, yeah, the, the effect that we are after, just if it's in the pair, the first position or the second position, and then... Um, yeah, we thought this was the clearest and most straightforward way, but I see position can be also interpreted differently, I guess. Yeah. Yes, so uh, I mean, when you presented your thesis today, you did not use position, you used like order, the temporal order of events, but again, as a subcategory of time predictions. But for me, this would be more like an interaction of what and when, like the order of events implies both temporal and and uh, what information, so formal prediction. So would that would that be a framework that would make sense, like to not study when and what separately, but also use as a third category the interaction of the two? I'm thinking. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, yeah, you can classify them differently, I guess. And it is an interaction indeed, because if we talk about um, deviant stimulus at the first position, it it interacts with the pair. So yeah, I think that's that's an option. Yeah. Maybe it's a bit difficult to <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's probably difficult to overgeneralize, but but maybe uh, some thoughts along these lines. Then I have one other uh, quite a remote question from what we just asked. So in some part of your thesis you're making a very controversial claim, namely that um, tinnitus could be or should be considered on a continuum between auditory illusions and auditory hallucinations with tinnitus falling somewhere in between. And I think that some people would find this very questionable because auditory hallucinations have a completely different uh, clinical uh, symptomatology behind them. So could you comment a little bit on that and how you would defend your point that these can be treated on a continuum, these very seemingly different states? Uh, I see. Um, yeah. I know that hallucinations have a yeah, different clinical value and are also attached with, I don't know, different emotional states, for example, or other yeah, um, um, yeah, things that define this condition. Um, but in tinnitus, I think there's still a quite fine line because um, some people only, so to speak, hear one tone, but other people hear a, hus a humming or a white noise, for example. And then other people, sometimes they hear a higher no a noise and sometimes they hear a lower noise. And then it develops, so, oh yeah, maybe you hear a melody or something. And then, you know, it develops into, um, is this a musical hallucination now? Um, with the clinical um, impacts or, or, or without. Um, and I think that there is a continuum. Um, and I think that, yeah, tinnitus falls on a very, um, yeah, on the slightest end of the of the continuum, I would say. 
but um, I think um, that's uh, that's there. And also, there's not a lot of literature um, looking into this, actually. Um, I think I remember one paper said that, um, yeah, we should clearly distinguish, obviously, the um, experience of tinnitus from the experience of musical hallucinations, okay? And then there was one paper, I think um, it was from Arne and colleagues, 2022 or something like this, and they said um, they tested people that had schizophrenia with auditory... Um, hallucinations doing the testing um, and then people with tinnitus without hearing loss or only with very mild hearing loss and also with tinnitus with hearing loss and then controls and they saw that the um, responses it was a passive like talk listen paradigm and the responses were um, quite similar between the people that had um, the hallucinations and the people that had tinnitus, but only when they also had severe hearing loss. So without the hearing loss and the tinnitus, the, this condition was more similar to the ones um, that were the control group. Yeah, so actually I think, yeah, maybe there is some kind of relation, but then always the hearing loss is involved there. So um, I would not cancel this out. I wouldn't say that this is only due to the tinnitus, but um, also re related to, yeah, some subtype of damage probably along the auditory pathway. All right, thank you very much. So I pass back to the rector. The question, the opportunity will be continued by Professor Weiss, who is Professor of Physiological Psychology and is working at the University of Salzburg. Professor Weiss. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, dear candidate, for the um, very clear presentation. So compliments, uh, obviously, to the thesis and yeah, um, especially you made a I think a very complex set of results, uh, very, very clear in your presentation. So congratulations to that as well, very explicitly. So my questions or my main questions would be, I would say rather high level, more conceptual. And my, my first question would be on your predictive network um, hypothesis. So within let's say the family of different uh, tinnitus models, and I'm especially thinking here um, on the, quite recent still predictive coding model from Will Sedley. Um, so to what extent are you complementing these, these set of theories or this, this, this theory, or are you clearly different? Are you making different predictions? Um, so could you make this a little bit more, um, more explicit, please? Mm -hmm. um, uh... Highly esteemed opponent, thank you so much for your compliments and your questions. Um, yes, I know what uh, model you're talking about. Um, this is the predictive coding model from uh, Sedley, I think 2016, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, uh, so this is not against this model. I think this is more an add-on, I would say. So um, in their model, they're talking about um, different um, um, alterations um, of the priors and that um, the tinnitus is then the normal, the new basic prediction of something, so that there's not silence as a basic prediction anymore. And I think this um, maybe comes due to um, structural and then after a while also functional alterations in the brain network that uh, may lead to those um, predictions. So I think, mm -hmm. yeah, this can be seen as a complementary approach. So, so, so what part on, let's say, from Will's perspective, so why is this, let's say, not enough for uh, understanding tinnitus? So why, what, what kind of niche are you filling with, with your um, conceptual approach that, I don't know, Will is, is missing? I think um, the focus on the um, auditory thalamus, because a lot of people, yeah, focus on yeah the cochlear functioning, for example, or alterations in the auditory cortex. Um, but I think that uh, the functioning of the MGB is um, yeah often missed. I mean, it's such a small structure. I also understand, and maybe yeah, um, we also don't know so much about it. Also, there's the, the most of the research, the research is is animal research. But I think this is um, adding to the model. Um, also, yeah, yeah, I think that's the main thing. Okay, so with, with in terms of the MGB, I totally agree. Yeah, so uh, uh, very little is known, and you did a great job in summarizing the. Um, the, the patterns and you come up with a little bit, let's say, with a with a, a network model of of of, of the thalamus and, and tinnitus. So 
obviously this is a, a, the, the state of the art. To what extent would you think that this is really a robust um, a robust pattern in, 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 I don't know, let's say classifying tinnitus. If I would have, I don't know, resting state uh, data from fMRI from a thousand uh, people with or without tinnitus, could I, well, do you think we could classify uh, tinnitus based on your specific um, connectivity patterns? Is this like, would you go that far or is this still, let's say, in the making um, a little bit? The... I think I wouldn't go that far, to be honest. I think um, I would use this model as a starting point to maybe, um, yeah, understand the functioning of tinnitus better, but also, as I said also during my presentation, add this um, as a as a focus point for future research. Um, during my PhD, I was or I'm still part of a project with the um, hospital in Maastricht, and we're working with patients and uh, a lot of other people, a big team, um, that are um, aiming to treat um, people that have very severe uh, tinnitus over a long period of time with the deep brain stimulation. And the target area of this mm -hmm. treatment option uh, is the MGB because we want to um, mm -hmm. yeah, try this. And now there was, uh, yeah, it's, it's initial research, but we already saw some benefits there. So we might see that altering um, the activity um, in this nucleus might have a beneficial effect for other areas along, or the, for the whole network along the auditory pathway, and therefore um, maybe relieve people from their burden or their mm -hmm. tinnitus. I don't know if you can talk about pain, mm -hmm. but it's often, yeah. Uh, yeah. So very, I think this is... fascinating. Where, yeah. I, I see I have uh, uh, one more minute, and I'm undecided which question to ask. So I would... I would go for this question here. So you uh, talk about telemocortical dysrhythmia as well in your your thesis, and how this could uh, link to uh, temporal predictions. So my my origin in the recollection of the Rudolfo Linas works, uh, which I think from the 1990s or so, he does he does not talk only about tinnitus, but basically I don't know a, a whole family of of disorders, and they're kind of united in. In the phenomenon that they, all these disorders should show um, telemocortical dysrhythmia. Would you also assume then that these uh, different disorders should um, lead to similar, uh, let's say, patterns in, in terms of your um, temporal prediction uh, uh, results or, or, or experiments? Or is this something very specific to, to tinnitus? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I know what you mean. I think he's um, also talking about yeah, chronic pain or other yeah, other conditions. I don't know. Of course, I didn't do research uh, on those groups or those populations, so um, I don't have a concrete answer to this. Um, I think that um, yeah, we know from other populations, for example, that temporal predictions are quite important when we work with people with Parkinson's, for example. Um, we know that uh, giving them a, a clear rhythm and a timing structure, we know that, for example, their their walking can be enhanced. So um, this is then maybe not um, yeah, only linked to tinnitus. And we know that temporal predictions play a role in multiple um, conditions. Um, but I don't know if it would generalize to be honest, I would be a bit cautious there, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, dear candidate. I will stop my questioning here. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you have some opportunity for later. Uh, but we will continue the opposition with Dr. Morel, who is a social professor with an expertise in auditory neuroscience and works at the Master University. Dear candidate, um, first I would like to congratulate you and also your uh, promotion team with um, a very nice thesis. I've, I enjoyed reading it uh, and I especially appreciated the way you combine uh, kind of basic neuroscience mm. theoret theoretical frameworks and then have really uh, uh, very clear applications of that as well. So uh, congratulations. Uh, but I also have questions, of course. And I would actually like to follow up on uh, the line that uh, Professor Weiss was, was asking mm -hmm. you about. Um, maybe 
to start that, that discussion, um, I would first like to ask you your opinion on some of the tables that you present in chapter two. So you have there an overview mm -hmm. of the uh, results of both in animal research and in human research on, on basically the involvement of, of the thalamus in, in tinnitus. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm not going to ask anything too specific, it's yeah, okay yeah. not to look at the table. Uh, but I, in, in looking at the tinnitus literature in general, I found always um, results to be very diverse across studies, and you already mm -hmm. mentioned in your in your chapter the kind of differences between animal and human research. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, uh, first of all, how whether you recognize that diversity, and whether you think that there's anything coherent in there, or maybe not, uh, and if that coherence might be related to when you start looking to the MGB or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your question. Um, yes, you're right. The research is quite broad and heterogeneous. Um, I try to, I don't know, give it a, a red thread or, I don't know, combine it somehow um, because there's not too much research done on the MDB because it's so small and mostly done in animals and then different types of animals and then the animal model they're using to test tinnitus or to induce tinnitus is different. So, yeah, in the all different methods, I mean, that's what the table is about. Um, so I think um, that we can use those information to, um, yeah, I don't know how to say this. I think we can try to combine this information as good as we can. So we have to take into account that, for example, in animals, first of all, different animals react differently to noise trauma. And also then, if you induce noise trauma and you do all those um, behavior testing, you don't know if the animals actually experience the tinnitus. Of course, there are some tests, but then, are the emotional factors, the mood effects that humans have when they experience tinnitus also over a long period of time, they are probably very different and also you cannot assess this. But then again, we take what we get here um, to see um, as much as we can about the functioning about, of the MGB. And also we know that the MGB is different, for example, when we look at uh, bats, for example, it, it works differently than when we look in mice. So. Um, yeah. So, so you would um, uh, not consider the literature more homogenous when you look, start looking towards the thalamus, towards the MGB. You, you still see a, a similar type of diversity uh, compared to other structures in the auditory pathway. When you when we talk about different uh, sorry. so for example if if I you know if you look at the um, the human results for yeah. example and you you look at resting state studies yeah. Connectivity changes are found everywhere, right? Between every structure, up and down, and um, instead, you 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 um, report um, based on the literature study that mostly for MGB2 cortex, it's mostly or auditory cortex at least, is mostly reduced connectivity mm. and maybe to other parts of cortex increased. Mm -hmm. is, is that did you find that to be rather consistent, or was there also a yeah. large amount of diversity? Actually, yes, for the MGB, okay. yes, and for the between MGB and auditory cortex is quite consistent. Higher cortical areas, um, yeah, higher cortical areas, you see this as a very broad term because there were a lot of different brain areas there. But um, yeah, this is quite consistent actually. Okay. Um, also, there were um, some reduced connections found um, between the cerebellum, for example, and I also saw this in two or three papers, okay. I think. Okay, then following up on that, yeah. or I don't know if that's really following up on that, but at least in the same direction, um, already Professor Weiss indicated these kind of two major tinnitus theories on involving the MGB, right? So the telemocortical disruption mm -hmm. and the noise cancellation, and you mentioned them as well in your, in your chapter two. And you actually state that um, your proposal, mm -hmm. your proposed framework can fuse, merge these two theories. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you, uh, to explain that a bit more, so how do you, um, yeah, how how do does your framework merge these two? Yeah, these two ideas? Um, yeah. So the um, telemico cortical framework states that um, uh, in tinnitus you have different coupling between frequencies. So they say that. Um, in the healthy brain, I don't know, I don't like to speak about healthy and not healthy, but in the normal functioning brain, maybe, <laughs> it's not a better term, but okay. Um, they say that there's a coupling between alpha and uh, gamma waves, and then gamma uh, is reflecting the tinnitus tone. This is what yeah, they hypothesize. And then that in people that experience tinnitus or more chronic tinnitus, also with 
um, differentiation that this alpha shifts then to theta and then theta becomes coupled to gamma. So this is this theory and the um, theory from Rauschecker, the noise cancellation theory says that um, there are alterations also in the limbic brain, also with the TRN, like another nucleus in the thalamus, and then they um, say that due to this um, also emotional processes um, change. And yeah, indeed, I did not focus on, for example, amygdala or um, parahippocampal activity, because they are also, yeah, I didn't do this in, the, in my theoretical chapter, so maybe this is then not very nicely integratable, but um, the alterations of the auditory thalamus and the um, therat thalamical cortical dysrhythmia theory, I think matches, because if you um, have those alterations in the burst and in the tonic mode, um, that we think we will see, or we see in uh, people that experience chronic tinnitus, um, then this um, translates to alterations also in the um, um, in the coupling between the oscillatory bands, and that's why I, th I, 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 I think that we can link those paradigms. Mm -hmm. Could I follow up still, or yeah? Okay, so I, I do see that it, how you would then fit to telemocortical dysrhapsia, yeah, right? Because there, indeed, uh, the idea is that you get a hyperpolarization of the MGB and that you get this bursting kind yeah. of firing, right? Um, how do you then link to, to, to noise cancellation? Because yeah. there it is more, I think, at least th this is how I have always understood the theory, mm -hmm. there it's more actually uh, uh, that the inhibition that normally comes from the tear and that that is somehow not working properly anymore, so that you actually get a hyper yeah. activation, so an increased response in MGB. Uh, yeah. Would that also still fit with your, your framework, or um, maybe not at a, at a biological level, but more at a conceptual level? Yeah, I don't know. So the, yeah, indeed, the theory says that there's less inhibition, so then the, the signal is just passed, <laughs> sorry, again, <laughs> passed on. Um, Yeah, maybe not quite right. I mean, I think it it can be compared, but um, yeah, I think um, that um, yeah, the alterations in the MGB. I don't know if, if they match then with the yeah with those statements. I'm okay. not so sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Then the opportunity will be continued by Dr. Hallingman who is um, an ear surgeon working at the ENT department at the Maastricht University Medical Center in Maastricht. Dear candidate, first of all, of course, uh, congratulations with an uh, excellent thesis and as well to your promoters and co-promoters. And I also wanted to compliment you on the beautiful front cover. <laughs> I would like to have this in the clinic, actually. <laughs> um, I see often tinnitus patients, and they are really mm. suffering often, yeah. uh, their quality of life. How would you explain to them what the impact of your research is and what the ultimate goal is for them to help them in the future? Yeah, a highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and your question. Um, indeed, we know that tinnitus patients suffer a lot. I mean, we tested them, and they were actually the first group that we tested for the chapter. Um, and People came from Amsterdam, slept a night in Maastricht just to take part in our study because they were like, yeah, maybe something is happening and please inform us about the results, just that we want to contribute to science and know more about this. So we know that this is a really debilitating um, condition. Also, we had one case which was um, really not nice in the course of the inclusion process of um, the DBS study. We had one person that could not be included in one of the pilot trials and uh, decided that uh, the person didn't want to live anymore. So we see this is um, severely impacting the life of people. And it's very important that we do research. I think that um, performing basic research to in, in order to understand the functioning of the tinnitus or how it develops and then maybe then developing treatment options, maybe with DBS, maybe with other means, as long as the people are helped afterwards, I think this is the most important. Um, and I would tell them, your question was how I would tell them um, how the tinnitus, um, yeah. I think that um, it's when they see you, probably the tinnitus is already chronic, I'm not sure, but it's possible. So then um, it's possible that um, when you age, this will also develop because when we age, our hearing changes. So it can, it's possible that it might get worse, but 
that you, I don't know, you understand what is happening in your brain maybe and that you learn how to live with this, accept this somehow and try to find people that are also affected and um, yeah, try to, to make the best out of it. It sounds yeah, really not scientific, but um, try to, to live with this as good as possible because um, if it's chronic, the probability that it will go away is quite low. Um, I have a question about uh, chapter four, of course, your mm -hmm. patients or your uh, research with tinnitus patients. Mm -hmm. um, as you uh, mentioned as well, age, hearing loss, tinnitus, mm -hmm. uh, they seem to be black and white items, but actually they're very uh, difficult and mm -hmm. also confounding. Mm -hmm. um, you match these uh, tinnitus or, or controls with age uh, matched persons, may aged controls, yeah. but you decide to uh, include patients with hearing loss up until a Fletcher index of 60 dB. Mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering why did you choose to do that, 60 dB? Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know why we chose the 60 in general, so I think this was um, already defined in the research protocol and then we were um, looking for the participants. Um, so I don't know, like, I don't, I cannot say if it was 60 or 50, for example. Do you know how much that would be, what that clinically means, 60 yeah, dB? Yeah, it's moderate, right? It's uh, actually from 35 dBs on, you would yeah. advise a hearing aid. Yeah. So 60 dB is Quite nearing high. severe hearing yeah. loss. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. That also makes our results... Um, yeah, it's hard to compare them, right? I understand. Maybe it would have been good to be more strict there uh, and only um, include people that have uh, yeah less hearing loss. But also, I yeah. mean, you're mentioning it. <laughs> this is uh, that, like the yeah. li big limitation in this chapter that we couldn't match people for hearing loss there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I realize <laughs> that life is difficult and doing research with patients is difficult, but yeah. in a perfect world, and you can choose from all the patients, yeah. how, would you do, how would you do a follow-up of this chapter yeah. four research? Mm -hmm. How would you set it up, include patients and compare patients? What would you be interested in most? Most. most. To help these tinnitus patients, of course, in the yeah. end. Yeah, yeah. That's a good thing that you say this to help the tinnitus patients because for me, as my researcher perspective now, I would include people that have less hearing loss but also tinnitus yeah. um, and do um, a similar test and see how much influence the, he the hearing loss had on the tinnitus. I mean, there are multiple studies that say that tinnitus is like the transitioning phase, right? Um, so that um, if you have some differentiation in, I don't know, the cochlea, for example, that um, the cortex tries to adjust to this and um, due to this, those alterations in the homeostatic, homeostasis and this process um, to find the balance again, then you develop the tinnitus. Um, so I think it would be really good if we would be able to match for hearing loss um, in the future when I do future experiments on this, but also then on high frequency hearing loss and really extensive testing. Um, because even if we do normal audiograms or do normal, normal audiometry, we know that there's still differentiation, for example, and people yeah, still might experience hidden hearing loss, yeah. um, although we don't see it. Um, so that would be that would be cool, yeah, in the future. <laughs> but, thank yeah. you for your answer. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Then we, the opportunity will be continued by Dr. Hausfeld, <laughs> who is associate professor, uh, assistant professor at um, with expertise in auditory neuroscience, and also works at the Maastricht University. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, dear candidate, um, dear Pierre, also from my side, um, congratulations to your work, congratulations to having the thesis done. If um, the previous opponent wouldn't have mentioned it, I would have also congratulated you on the design. <laughs> um, of course, also uh, congratulations to the promotion team. Um, so I usually personally don't do uh, research with clinical populations. So for me, that is a very interesting field to go into mm -hmm. and also to read about uh, the framework that you set up uh, for, for um, looking at uh, difficulties with predictions or let's say impact that um, auditory predictions might have in the aging or tinnitus population. Mm. Um, 
So I will, um, most of the questions I would have um, would be probably about chapter three, I would say. Mm -hmm. And maybe a very naive question I would have first is, um, so let's say coming from classical ERP images that you get. So you, you have basically some, some very early components, you have some mid-level components, and then you start off with your P50, P1, N1, P2, and so on. Um, and in, uh, in, in chapter three, you show very nicely for CZ, the time course of mm. that. And the P50 um, doesn't look like the P50 that I expect. Mm -hmm. it, it has two bumps. Mm -hmm. And why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what is it? Is it like a P30 that is actually interfering there? Because I Maybe. think yeah. the, the quality that you actually have in terms of data seems to be pretty sharp, right? Yeah. Because you have a huge amount of repetitions, you mm -hmm. have a huge, uh, you, you actually have a significant delay or highly significant delay of two milliseconds, right? And mm -hmm. for that you need really, really good data quality to make this highly significant. So what is this, what is this double bump P50 that, that we see there? I'm not sure whether you know what figure I mean, but um, I think it's, what is it? Uh, let's 60, say, page 60. Uh, page 60, 63. 61, exactly, yeah, so figure yeah, two. 61, yeah. um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliments and for your question. Yeah, I completely know what you mean, and I see that. Um, actually, one of the reviewers um, had a similar question for this paper, and oh, then I looked into the literature back then, and I saw that this happens actually quite often, um, that we see this double P key P50, um, and yeah, you're right, maybe this is a P30 that is maybe leaking in there. I'm not 100% sure, I cannot uh, say this um, for sure now. Another comment that we also got from uh, the reviewers there was for the activity for the younger group, if it was actually different from zero, and then, yeah, we also tested this, and it is, but um, yeah, that is not related to the double peak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was thinking, so it, it's not that basically um, you have, maybe because it was corona at some point, right? So, yeah, um, everything. <laughs> yeah. So things might have been interrupted, right? So it could be that at some point you restart uh, the experiment yeah. and basically mm -hmm. then maybe timings are a bit off and you actually might see this back in the ERP. So I don't know. Like, is, is it also visible in single participants that you have this funny uh, ribble uh, in the P50? Yeah, I don't remember anymore, to be honest, if it's visible in the single participants. This was quite some years ago, and I don't know by heart anymore. Um, for this study, we didn't stop and start. Uh, mm -hmm. This data was collected before COVID, mm -hmm. uh, so that was good. We had time to analyze the data for the tinnitus chapter. This was collected during COVID, and that's why it was um, also so hard to match the patients with the controls because people were not coming into the lab, especially older ones. I mean, yeah, you know, it was really complicated, but this was not the case for this uh, chapter. So um, this mm -hmm. is not due to some hardware delay or something. Um, yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking maybe because you are using basically linear ramps, basically, that by introducing these linear ramps, you actually might get onset slash offset where basically Late. This, uh, Exactly, yeah, true. Something like that, that yeah. because it's a 10 millisecond thing and it looks like you have a 10 millisecond gap between these two bumps. Actually, that's a really good thing. I, I didn't think about this, but you're right. Uh, out on set a linear ramp. Uh, so, yeah, there's a possibility. Maybe. Um, yeah, true. But yeah, I think the, the main thing, main control would be to see whether this is really like... Do you see it in single participants, yeah. right? So that would be, then you know, okay, this might be mm -hmm. like a bipolar distribution of participants, so to say, but, well. Um, yeah. Another question that I would have um, would be um, um, about the paradigm that you are using. So uh, you had this isochronous and, and random uh, time sequences, and um, what um, uh, you introduce, um, and reasonably well, um, is to let them count the number of deviants. Mm. Um, so the whole framework that you set up is about prediction, right? And mm. uh, you also mentioned in, in, in this theoretical paper or in the theoretical chapter that you had that uh, sometimes attention prediction are, are hard to differentiate. Um, so, and introducing a task, of course, will do something to, uh, to the auditory uh, response. Yeah. Um, so um, my question is like, is this like comparable, first of all, between chapters? Mm. Was, was there basically a task also in the second one? Mm. But it was <laughs> rapid stimulation, so I, I imagine that this was not a counting thing. Um, and so if, if not, like, what do you think, uh, do you think that this is a big 
uh, a big issue, or do you think that well, um, well, it doesn't matter for what we want to, uh, what you want to discuss with P50 and one, which are rather early in, in the hierarchy. Basically, uh, this is not such a big, uh, such a big problem. Yeah. So first of all. Um to answer the first part of your question, so um, we didn't um, have them count in the second chapter, uh, in the second experiment, sorry. So um, in the first experiment, when we, when we worked with the younger and older adults, they were counting indeed, but they, the second one was a passive uh, listening paradigm. Mm -hmm. So in order to compare the results between those chapters, this makes it more difficult. So I think there, yeah, it might be um, yeah, more problematic. Um, I agree. And when we did this, actually, um, that we changed this paradigm um, so that the people did not need to count, because also the sequences were quite long. Um, it was quite hard to pay all the attention the whole time. But the reason for this was that um, there were um, previous um, papers um, from uh, Schwarz and colleagues with the same paradigm, and they didn't see big differences uh, between the attention component, at least for those components that we are interested mm -hmm. in. And that's why we thought, yeah, it's OK. They don't need to count. It's fine if we just do ma make this a passive listening paradigm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, I see I have a tiny bit of time. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, oh I would have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, and especially also about the aging population. Mm. Um, so um, going away, let's say, from event-based paradigms uh, mm -hmm. and going into something which is a bit more naturalistic, mm -hmm. um, there is, yeah, I don't know, since 2012, basically, I think there is basically a bit of a... Uh, a tendency to go towards more continuous uh, sounds mm -hmm. while you are performing your experiments. And uh, one interesting uh, observation there, so I'm talking about this kind of sound tracking, speech tracking, mm. or um, one interesting observation mm -hmm. there is that the tracking of a sound, mm -hmm. um, really surprisingly, at least in the beginning, is a lot better in, in the uh, elderly population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you think um, that uh, maybe this very strong P50 response that you, uh, that you uh, observe might lead or might have something to do with that? Um, there are some theories behind it, mm -hmm. um, some even already starting in the periphery, having to do with uh, nonlinearity that mm -hmm. basically with hearing loss actually disappears, so you, uh, your response basically becomes more linear, so your differences between loud and soft sounds are, are basically in the elderly uh, um, mm -hmm. increased. Um, do you think that there is something that um, this, these two um, processes might have something to do with each other, or do you think, do you think that these are very independent and um, I mean, it's a very open question, and yeah. uh, you know, it's it's really like a brainstorm, and, and so so there is no right or wrong there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah, I like uh, no, I like this actually. Um, I I read some literature that um, in elderly the yeah maybe the focus is a bit different. I don't know because also the hearing in in speech in noise or something is also better in older people than in younger adults because I think then. Um, yeah, maybe the yeah the focus is different, or the process speech maybe different. I don't know. Um, I think maybe because those um, the component like the P50 especially is pre attentive, right? So this cannot like there are some frontal components maybe that also play a role there, but this cannot happen very consciously. So I think then it would be an automatic process, and um, yeah, maybe it's more a fine tuning that um, when you age. Um, yeah, You've, you have a higher sensitivity to this or something like this, maybe, not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's possible, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, there was some idea also that, um, at least um, with these tracking studies, that uh, elderly might have, um, might simply pay more attention to these uh, low level mm -hmm. uh, dynamics of the sound. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, they will have a bit of a, a uh, bit of a trouble, troubling time, I think, towards the higher frequencies, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But as, because they don't have this advantage, they actually pay more attention to the slower oscillations. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether this will also uh, be, uh, whether the P50 has anything to do with it. But it would be interesting. Okay. You may give an answer to the 
question that was still not finished, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, Pierre Brinkman, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because faith decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Get the
<clears throat> Pia Brinkman, uh, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the way you defended it. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Kotz is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction. In accordance with Dutch university custom, I invite you, uh, I invite your supervisor to uh, now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Pia Brinkman, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. So now it's time for the promotion team to say some words. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, just a few words, really, from my side, starting this. So, um, first of all, congratulations, of course. It was a pleasure <laughs> over these years. And really, you're one of these fortunate cases of stud excellent students who decide to stay here even after they have already uh, conducted their studies here and, and you decided to continue your research path here in Maastricht. And uh, I have to say from the start this was energetic. So even before you became a PhD candidate, I already had the pleasure to supervise you as, well, in your voluntary elective, so even reaching before that, and uh, back then I could barely keep up with you providing even more data and suggesting why not doing this one more additional statistical analysis, even back then. And you really took this initiative into your PhD uh, from securing also competitive funding for, for this position, uh, all these diverse methods that you mastered in the course of it, and overcoming a lot of technical issues, other issues, and handling quite impressive amounts of data as well that you collected. And uh, it has been said once in between, but we certainly shouldn't forget that you managed to test a special elderly population in quite difficult times. You managed to get them into the lab and do all this work and, well, into a confined lab booth, basically, during corona, right? So that was certainly a major achievement. So neither of this nor any other difficulties along the way have stopped you from defending the work here today. And um, I would say even with some things might go on still and uh, projects are not necessarily finished, I just really want like, to con congratulate you on this and maybe suggest to take a deep breath. <laughs> uh, Dr. Brinkman. Thank you. continue a little bit. So Pia is truly one of our own. She started her master's in clinical and cognitive neuroscience focusing on neuropsychology in 2017 after finishing her bachelor's degree in Maastricht. Bright, energetic and always ready to smile, 
PS started out my, in my first period course brain damage and we never looked back. Pia is Pia, always ready to take on a challenge, always running, but never losing sight of what comes next. Like going to Montreal, yet another city starting with an M, to gain some experience in working with older adults and EEG. In parallel, you took up the challenge to apply for a PhD stipend with the Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes, a tough, multi-layered process with first-hand science hurdles, like receiving a proposal evaluation and an interview in which you had to defend your plan. And Pia did it. Thus, you could start your PhD on January 1st, 2020, a road with many hurdles, like COVID, PhD research uh, that is one of its kind and very personal challenges. But here we go, Pia did it again. Almost three publications later, a Finnish, Finnish thesis beautifully graphically enriched and a successful defense today, the so-called COVID PhD, O-Tone Pia, is done, and very impressively so. You've done more than well, Pia, and for the future to come, the very best. Remember, Pia can do it. With my very best wishes and congratulations to you and your family for this success, now take a breather, celebrate, and enjoy. Thank you. Dr. Pia Brinkman, <laughs> I would like to congratulate you on behalf of the Maastricht University, more especially the Faculty of Psychology and Neuroscience, and even more especially the Department of Psycho Neuropsychology and Psychopharmacology. Um, congratulations for this wonderful achievement. Um, I also would like to thank the external reviewers, Dr. Oh, I have to, my memory is not so good. I'm getting an older person. Um, Professor Bendixson and Professor Weiss for the contribution and evaluating uh, thesis, uh, not just from our internal perspective, also from an external perspective. Um, I also, I was thinking about, I was always looking at the um, statements you had, and one statement was about, was from Franz de Waal. Yeah. And actually he passed away. I know, 14th week, yeah. of March, so, I know. Uh, that, but again, um, that research is, and the outcomes are funny, is, I think is a really nice statement. But I think mm. um, he meant it in a very um, sincere way. Mm. Yeah. But that, that struck my, my uh, attention. Mm. Um, and herewith, I would like to end the session. Mm. And go into the logistics here, because we will have now a photograph with you, your parents, maybe your family will join, with the external um, candidates of uh, opponents in the background. Then we will have a reception at the rafter. Uh, but you can go already to the rafter, but we will have still another picture. It will be one big photo event here at the stairs, and then we will join you later on. So that will be the logistics, and uh, thank you for your attendance, and um, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> 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 